Hello and welcome to this Alchemist Chemistry video looking at how to calculate the formula of a hydrated salt. As always, if you find this video useful and informative, please feel free to give it a like, maybe think about subscribing, or even ringing the bell to keep notified of our upcoming videos. Thanks very much in advance. So to the matter at hand, the aims of this video are threefold. Firstly, I would like to tell you what a hydrated salt actually is. Then I want to take you through how we determine the formula of a hydrated salt using experimental methods. And then finally, I want to take you through a practice example question calculation to show you the best method for completing a question and calculation to determine the formula of a hydrated salt. Hydrated salts, sometimes known as hydrates, are actually quite common. And you may be aware of some examples of these already. One would be blue hydrated copper sulfate crystals, often used in school experiments. A medicinal example would be Epsom salts. Epsom salts are actually a hydrated form of magnesium sulfate and they're named after the town of Epsom in Surrey, where they were first discovered. Epsom salts are often added to water, where they dissolve and have many therapeutic benefits, including soothing muscles and relieving aches. And it's thought that maybe even the magnesium ions can be absorbed from the water through pores in the skin and can actually help to relieve conditions such as, such as arthritis. So a really important medicinal example there. Naturally occurring hydrates usually form in shallow pools of water where there's a high concentration of the ions that form the salt and also not all the water has been able to evaporate. So it does need to happen in the presence of water. And there are two ways in which a hydrated salt can form. Firstly, water molecules can occupy positions within the giant ionic lattice itself when the crystal slowly forms and therefore they're trapped inside the lattice structure. Or it's possible the water molecules can actually form electrostatic attractions with either the anions or cations, positive and negative ions, that make up the giant ionic lattice. Either way, we assume that the water molecules are intrinsically part of the giant lattice ionic structure. With that in mind, experimentally, there's only one way we're going to be able to get rid of that water, which is intrinsically bound up with the giant ionic structure itself. And that's with intense heating to remove those water molecules, usually in the form of steam. And so this diagram here is an example of the apparatus you would need to use to do that. Just a quick round of what we've got here. We have our Bunsen burner on a half open collar. So we've only got a blue flame, not a roaring flame. So not the most intense heating, but strong enough to uh, drive off the water. A tripod is being used to hold a pipe clay triangle, which is just a a ceramic triangle which will hold the vessel we're heating and then we're using a crucible to actually contain the hydrate itself. We use a ceramic crucible because ceramics are very heat resistant and it's unlikely to break or crack under that intense heating. Now onto the experiment itself. The first thing you want to do is to weigh with an electrolytic balance and record two decimal places the mass of the crucible with its lid in grams. You would then add a set mass of the hydrate to the crucible, return it to the balance and weigh the mass of the crucible with lid and the hydrated salt all together and record that mass value again to two decimal places. Then you carefully place your crucible with its lid on top and the hydrate inside on the pipe clay triangle, light your Bunsen turn it to a half color to create a blue flame and begin to heat the crucible containing your set mass of hydrate using that blue Bunsen flame. Over time, as steam is generated and driven out from the hydrate, it's gonna build up pressure and it's gonna not be able to escape from the crucible. So every minute or so, you're gonna carefully lift the lid of the crucible using a pair of tongs to release that steam. Return the lid, and carry on this process heating for five minutes. The main function of the lid itself is to prevent any spitting out of hot solid from the crucible because that would massively affect the recorded mass and therefore the accuracy of the value we would measure. Once that five minutes of heating and lifting the lid is up, you would then turn your Bunsen flame to a safety flame, a yellow flame, 
move it to one side on the heat proof mat and allow your crucible to cool down. Once sufficiently cool, you would then take it to the electronic balance and weigh the mass of the crucible lid and the now heated hydrate and record and note that mass in rough. At this point, you then return the cool crucible back to your setup and repeat the process again for another minute. Heat and then re-weigh once the crucible had cooled down and record the new mass. And you'd keep repeating this process until that recorded mass stops descending. We call this process heating to constant mass. And we're ensuring that all of the water has truly been driven out of the hydrate. So the hydrate is no longer a hydrate. It is an anhydrous salt. Now we get into the business end of things, the calculation itself. And to solve this, we're going to use a variation on an empirical formula grid method to complete this calculation. If you are struggling to remember exactly what an empirical formula is, no problem at all. Maybe you want to click on this link here, take you to my video on empirical formula which might help refresh you before we try this out. So let's look at the question together. 13.2 grams of hydrated zinc sulfate containing that water of crystallization as shown by the formula given. ZnSO4 is the formula of the anhydrous salt and the dot stands for water of crystallization. Those water molecules bound up as part of the ionic structure. And X shows that I don't know the number of moles of water present. That's what I'm trying to find out. That hydrated salt was heated to constant mass using that method just seen. When reweighed at the end of that process, the now anhydrous zinc sulfate without the water had a mass of 7.4 grams. And then you're asked to determine the formula of the hydrate. The blue and green colors will become more relevant later. First of all, you think about how to work out how many grams of water was lost when this hydrated salt was heated. Well, Actually, all we need is these two numbers. 13.2 grams represents the mass of the salt with the water. 7.4 grams represents the mass of the salt without the water. So if we take away the mass of the anhydrous salt without the water from the mass of the hydrated salt with the water, we're left with the amount of water which must have been released, which is 5.8 grams of water in the form of steam, which was driven off upon heating during this experiment. Now we come to the particular empirical formula grid method section of the calculation. And for hydrated salts, there are a few variations on the standard empirical formula grid we have to take into consideration. Usually in empirical formula grids, the first row contains the label elements, and we write down the elements found within the question for the empirical formula problem we're trying to solve. But here, we've actually got compound or molecular formula. And that's because our aim is to work out how many more moles of water there are compared to the zinc sulfate component of the hydrated salt. So all we write down are the components of the hydrated salt, the anhydrous part, which is the zinc sulfate formula, and then the water part, which is H2O. The next part of the empirical formula grid is as standard. We write down the mass from the question. Well, if we look at the question, we know that at the end of the experiment, there was 7.4 grams of anhydrous zinc sulfate remaining. So we know the mass of zinc sulfate, as ZnSO4, is going to be 7.4 grams. And we also now know that we have 5.8 grams of water being driven off based on our calculation from the previous section. At this point, we want to calculate the relative masses of the zinc sulfate and the water. So we're going to work out the relative formula mass of zinc sulfate because it's an ionic compound and the molecular mass of water because it's a covalently bonded molecule. But the process here is exactly the same. We're going to add together the relative masses of the constituent atoms of different elements that make up the molecule or compound involved. Let's start off with the zinc sulfate. If we look at the product table at the relative masses of zinc, sulfur and oxygen, we find that zinc is 65, sulfur is 32, Oxygen is 16. So we add those all together. 65 plus 32 plus 16 times 4 because there's four oxygens as part of the sulfate iron SO4 that makes up zinc sulfate. So the total of all those values together is 161. That's the relative formula mass of zinc sulfate. Same thing for water. The relative mass of hydrogen is 1 multiplied by 2 because the formula of water is H2O. One oxygen. Relative mass of an oxygen atom is 16. So the total molecular mass 
of the relative molecular mass of the entire molecule is 18. Now we're going to work out what this symbol N means. N is the algebraic symbol used to denote the term mole. We're going to calculate the number of moles of zinc sulfate, the number of moles of water present, using our molar triangle formation. So moles is equal to mass divided by the relative mass of the substance being investigated. So all we're going to do is write down the masses from the question and divide them by the relative masses we've just determined to find out how many moles of zinc sulfate and how many moles of water are present. 7.4 grams divided by 161 gives us 0.046 moles of zinc sulfate present in our hydrated salt. 5.8 grams of water divided by 18 equals 0.32 moles of water was present in our hydrated salt. So we can see straight off the bat, there were many more moles of water than there were moles of zinc sulfate present in the hydrate. So at this point, we have all the information we need to determine the formula of the hydrated salt. We're going to work out something called a molar ratio. If we divide both these numbers of moles by whichever one is the smallest, we'll be comparing the two numbers against each other as a magnitude of size to find out how many times bigger the larger number is compared to the small number. That's what happens when you divide by the smallest. And hopefully it's going to come out as a whole number and give us a very simple ratio of the numbers of moles of one substance compared to the number of moles of other, which we can just plonk straight into our formula. Let's see if it works. So if we divide 0.046 by itself, of course it's going to give us one. But if we divide 0.32, the large number, by 0.046, the small number, we get out the value 6.957. That's so incredibly close to the whole number seven, we are at, allowed to round up to the nearest whole number if it is really close like that, so we make it seven. So effectively what we're saying here is that for every one mole of zinc sulfate in this hydrated salt, we expect to find seven moles of water comparatively. That means we now know the formula of the hydrate. It is ZnSO4 dot seven H2O. For every one zinc sulfate formula unit, you're going to have seven moles of water present. So there you have it, using empirical formula grid method to solve a hydrated salt calculation problem. I really hope that was useful to you guys and helpful in how to solve those sorts of calculations. So at this point at the end of the video, I just want to say one more time, thank you very much for watching. I really hope you found it useful. If you did, don't forget to give it a like. It really helps to motivate me and keep me going with these videos. And if you want to see more of our content to really help your learning develop and continue, please do check out the videos available. Um, and I'll see you next time. Thank you very much.